And the Lord will add to that with his gifts, his discernment, everything else. Now I talked today about the faith attacks that God's going to be raising up teams to do. I think spectacular things are uh, going to be done there. What do we have better to do? We've got to learn to build faith bombs that we can throw into a crowd and have everybody's attention instantly and impact it with the knowledge that God is among us. God is here. Then know what to do with it. We need those like Peter who said, there's 3,000 souls. I gotta get them to the I gotta get them saved. And I think John, the prophetic one there, was probably in space on the day of Pentecost. Typical prophetic guy, he's saying, what do tongues mean? What is all you know? And uh, but we need those who everybody has their part to play. But harvest is here. This is all about harvest. And we've got to, to gather together and be able to respond and bring those in who God is calling in these situations. Okay, I want to give you just a couple more um, trends. I felt like I got in a, a download. And I'm sharing these with you, but they came, what I feel like was about prophetic revelation. One of them was that we're going to see nationalism is going to begin to displace collectivism and multiculturalism. And this is God stirring up nationalism in nations again. Because one of the things he wants them to do, wants every nation to do, is to recover, to, to recover its history, its heritage, but also its purpose and destiny. He said that when he comes, he's going to divide the nations as she goes. He's coming to judge the nations. And you're going to see nations separated into nations. Now, can we do that without becoming racist? Without doing it in pride or arrogance? You know, there's a good way to do this and a bad way. But this is something that is from the Lord. I think you're going to see a real turning away from a lot of philosophies and even religious teachings that uh, are counter to the will of the Lord. He made the nations. He made the tribes. He made the tongues. He made us all unique. He loves diversity. He made every snowflake difference. He loves diversity. He loves the uniqueness he put in each one. And there's a way that we can honor that in all the nations. And yet, you know, have the right kind of identity that we have in our own tribe that God has put us in, but rightly relate to and respect and honor all the others. He has put his gifts and his callings in all tribes and all races. And he created them for a purpose, as we see in Genesis, and he doesn't want that mixed up. In fact, I think one of the major purposes of the devil is to try to blur the distinctions that God has made clear. The distinction between male and female. It's one reason, you know, I make a lot of fun of Texas. Texas. But I love Texas. One reason I love so much, you, it's, there's some, some place in Texas that isn't true anymore, but for most of it, the men are still men and the women are women. And you know, you can be called, I don't believe there's a ceiling on any woman and what she can walk in in God. I don't think there is a ceiling. But you don't have to be a man to get there. We've got to be who we were called to be. And the same is true of men. And I go in countries now where the, you can't even find a man that is masculine. This is an affront to the way God created us. This is an affront. And uh, to be masculine is not to be 
you know, anti-women. I think it's, that's just my opinion, and if you share a different opinion, God will fix you. Okay? Just like my computer. But, um, now I'm just saying, which is a southern term for, you can say anything if you finish it with, I'm just saying, and get away with it. There's one other term you've got to learn if you're not from the South, but it's really useful in the South. You can say anything bad about anyone and just finish it with, well, bless their heart. And it's all good. It's all good. You get away with it, okay? <clears throat> I'm just giving you some tips for, for life here. We've got to find our destiny and purpose for our nation. We normally have a lot of nations represented at almost every gathering here. You know, we need our own purpose, our own call. We also need to hear from God for our destiny and purpose for our nations. And one of the reasons why some of them are falling into such foolishness in these times is because they don't have a vision. They don't have a vision. And God's called his people to impart that vision to the nations. And if they know they have a purpose and a destiny, I say, you're going to see them thrown off a whole lot of this foolishness that has taken so many under to But there are great moves of God. One of the Lord starts showing me about it. It was coming to a nation. It started showing me many years ago. I've gotten a whole lot more recently, but it's on Cuba. I'm looking for the greatest, purest move of God yet in history to take place in Cuba. It is going to be extraordinary. And it's going to, there's a purity of a love for God that you're going to see in Cuba. A fascination with God that I believe is going to eclipse anything that has ever been seen in a whole nation before. Alright, here's one. Russia. There is a sense of the righteousness and holiness of God that is going to come upon Russia. And the biggest revival in history in the church age is going to ignite in Russia. It's going to touch many other nations, but it's going to ignite in Russia. One of the reasons, I don't know what you think about Putin and all that he's doing, but uh, God's using this guy. He's going to take influence all over the place, but it's going to make this move of God. He may not know that. I'm sure he doesn't. But I think God's going to use it just like he used the Greeks to spread a common language throughout the world in preparation for the coming of the gospel. He used Alexander the Great and some of the other. And Nicholas was there. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, that was a setup by God. We need to understand... And some of the things going on in the nations is preparation for what God is about to do. I tell you, there is an extraordinary revival of God. I think the great, the biggest in history that is going to ignite in Russia. Somehow Cuba is going to help ignite what gets ignited in Russia. I don't know how, but I know that's going to happen. China. He showed me China being like a great filter. It's going to help purify the gospel. Now he's not going to, they're not going to change the gospel, of course. We've added so much to the gospel. The China, the, the church in China, what God does in China, is going to be like a huge filter to cleanse the message. Okay? Now, you know, there's a saying that in Jerusalem, the gospel became a, a religion. In Greece, it became a philosophy. In Rome, it became an institution. In Britain, it became a tradition. In America, it became an enterprise. There's some truth to that. You know how the gospel's been spreading around the world. There's some truth to this. 
to the application of the gospel and the manifestation of the way the church both reveals itself, the way it takes on the, the nature of this message. But something is going to come forth in China that's going to help purify and get us back to the pure core of the gospel. Okay? Now, all these other things are good. They're good traditions. They're good institutions. They're good philosophies. Enterprise is a good thing. And, for, and in some ways, these nations that were centers of cultural influence on a broad plane that really impacted much of the earth, they were meant to. But as often happens, along with the good comes a whole lot of baggage, a lot of the bad, and wrong applications. So, but I don't want to get too deep into that, but start praying, you know, pray for China. I know the many here are called to, to China. I know Singapore is going to become the financial capital of the world. It's going to displace New York and every place else, but it's because, because of the financial integrity. There's going to, I don't know if it has it now, but it's going to come forth in Singapore. It's going to be trustworthy, so God is going to trust Singapore to be the financial capital of the world. Africa is a great unity movement that's going to come to Africa. And we're going to see Africa starting to unite. It's never happened. We're going to see, and it's going to be the Lord, and Africa is going to become an extraordinary economic and political power in the world. I know a lot of people think we're already in the Great Tribulation, so how's all this going to happen? I don't know. Maybe we're not in the Great Tribulation yet, as you have defined it. Maybe there are a lot of other answers to these things. Now let me talk a little bit about some things I was shown about the U.S. I saw two great traumas coming upon the U.S. I mean, these were like traumas on the level of will we make it through this. One of them illuminated the divisions in the nation where we didn't know we were this divided. We look pretty divided now. It looks like getting more and more so, but there's something coming that's going to really highlight just how divided we are. And then I saw a second trauma coming that would unite us. And it's like that unity that God wants to call us into could have never happened without the first trauma. And without us really seeing how divided we are, but also how much we need each other. Okay? That's the encouraging part. No, it is encouraging. You know, Paul said in Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations shall we enter the kingdom of God. Every trial or every tribulation has a gateway to the kingdom. As of the world. And that's why we should look at every trial in our life. Every trial in every one of our lives right now is supposed to lead us to the kingdom. There's a doorway in that trial. How many of you are not going through trials right now? I didn't ask how many of you were trials. A <laughs> jury's not going through a trial. Praise God. We're going to get him saved so he can go through them like the rest of us. <laughs> no. But we've got to, you know, that's why. You know, James wrote, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. He said, you know, the testing of our faith. Peter wrote that the testing of our faith was more valuable than gold. Think of that. Do you, every time a trial comes your way, do you look at that like a pot of gold? If we had true spiritual discernment, that's what we would see. This is better than gold. That's true material. Because there's a gateway to the kingdom there. Okay. Um, we really need to pray for France. Okay? And we need to also wake up. When the enemy's hitting a country or a place or a city, 
let's immediately discern what God's purpose is there. You Paris got here, I hope we start, I hope you start praying for Paris right away. Now, I know the Lord showed me this many years ago, but uh, France is going to also be a part of one of the greatest moves of God at the end. But it's going to unite with Germany and Italy in this movement that would be one of the most important at the end. And uh, this has to do with, uh, you know, John having the last word. You know, Peter, Paul, and John are called the three pillars of the church. Peter was, you know, had seemed to have the leading apostolic authority in the beginning of the birthing of the church. But pretty soon he was eclipsed by Paul, and Paul's teachings were needed to lay the foundation, give us strong roots, and understand the new covenant, the grace of God, and the atonement, and all these things was badly needed. But John had the last word. You know, the way you're called often reflects your calling. Peter was fishing. Lord said, I'll make you a fisher of men. And uh, John was mending nets. I believe he was given the calling of tying everything together. That's why you see his gospel tying the others together. His epistles tie the new covenant together. Of course, the book of Revelation ties the whole Bible together. And by the way, we're about to really understand the book of Revelation. It's time. You know, we could have understood it all along. I know almost all Christians think that is such a mystery. How could we ever read it and understand it? Think about this. It's the only book in the Bible that you get. There's a promised blessing just for reading it. So that should have us reading it pretty. And also, it's called a revelation, not a hiding. It's God revealing something. And he gives you two keys in the very first, you know, right there in the first verse, two keys that if you understand those two keys, you can easily understand all of them. And it's amazing how many do not understand those two keys. You can read many books that are written on the book of Revelation, they never even address those two main keys, and therefore, to me, all kinds of speculation and all comes about. So what are the two keys? First, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the enter. And when you write books on it, and 90% of the book is about the Antichrist, something's a little out of whack. It's about Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. The other thing is, which God gave to him to reveal to his bond servants. And you've got to be a bond servant to understand that. You've heard me say plenty, there are not many bond servants. I don't think they're many disciples. If you use Jesus' own definition of what it meant to be a disciple, I, I don't think many would qualify. 